Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the open symposium of the JCES uh, 58th annual conference. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, I, I'm Kazuhiro Sugimoto of Tohoku University. And uh, today I play a role as moderator of the symposium. So before we start, please make sure that uh, the symposium is being recorded. Uh, as you see on the screen. Uh, yeah, you can see REC uh, mark uh, on your screen. Uh, so I, and so, so, so please uh, make sure that this is being recorded, right? And uh, I, I'd like to briefly explain how to use Zoom functions because uh, simultaneous interpretation between J English and J Japanese is available today. And so uh, probably uh, many people are uh, used to their functions, but uh, I will explain that a little bit. Uh, regarding the Zoom functions, uh, we use uh, three functions mainly today. Firstly, uh, we can, uh, you can find the Q&A icon on the, the bottom of your screen. When you have a question, please click the Q&A icon and send your question to a speaker uh, or a uh, presenter. And uh, so please send your question in Japanese or English. And uh, please be careful to make sure to clarify to whom you are asking, okay? And we are going to have a Q&A session after all the presentations. Uh, we will deal with the some questions uh, or, or all questions, I hope, uh, from the audience uh, in the discussion part, in the last discussion part. So not after every presentation, okay? So secondary, we will provide speakers materials or other information during the webinar uh, using the chat function, okay? You can find it in the middle of the, the bottom of your screen. Please receive the information by clicking the chat icon, all right? And finally, as I said, uh, uh, we are providing simultaneous interpretation. So please find interpretation icon uh, in Japanese, tsuyaku icon at the uh, it's a, yeah, global icon uh, at the bottom uh, yeah, of your screen and select either Japanese or English. And, uh, and uh, in addition, please make sure that you turn on the mute original audio uh, button. Okay. Uh, in Japanese, original audio mute ni suru. Otherwise you will hear both English and Japanese simultaneously. It's, uh, it's confusing. Uh, so Okay, and uh, so that's the three points uh, you need to pay attention to uh, when you uh, you participate in the, this symposium, okay? All right, so we will start the symposium now, okay? Uh, first of all, we would like to invite Professor Yonezawa. Uh, Professor Yonezawa has been playing a very critical role in organizing this symposium. He will deliver now deliver an opening remark and introduce today's speakers, okay? So Yonezawa Sensei, could you start please? Uh, thank you very much, Professor Sugimoto and uh, hello everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Hokkaido and the Tohoku members of the Japan Compile Verification Society, JCES, I would like to welcome you to today's Open Symposium. We set the title of the today's symposium as Internationalization of Education Research and the Role of the Comparative and International Education. Comparative and international education has contributed to the education research communities with its international and comparative theories, frameworks, and methodologies. Based on these international profiles, our research is now recognized as a mainstream of education research. At the same time, the various field of the education research, such as the sociology of education, economics education, uh, psychology of education, are also 
activating their international activities. And the international exchange with the global and regional education research associations, and also the education association with other countries. These phenomena could be identified as the internationalization of education research and also the internationalization of education research associations. Then what are the values to be international uh, in education research and the education research associations? I am currently leading a research project examining the internationalization of education research associations. Under this project, we have conducted interviews and open discussion with the leader of the major education research association in various fields in Japan and other mainly non-English speaking countries such as the uh, mainland China, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, and Germany. The, uh, this slide shows a tentative summary of the values to be international we have heard from the, these discussions. As to the positive values yielded through the internationalization could be summarized as the left-hand side. The first, education research is universal, borderless in nature. Uh, I think it is applicable for any kinds of the academic research. Also, the research performance became assessed by the international citation. So the, we are quite familiar with the subject level, uh, the ranking so-called, and the education is also one of the major fields that can be learned. And also that we are really sensitive that the, where our graduate school is positioning. And international research activities, exchange and collaboration activate knowledge creation. To know somebody uh, different is also, uh, of course the kind of the, the main source of the new knowledge creation. And finally, education phenomena are becoming international, transnational, and global. At the same time, we also have had the following concerns or even counter arguments against the overstress of internationalization. Education and education research have developed linked with the national and the local context. Research and uh, research communities based on national language and culture are the basis of ownership and identity. And finally, national and local contexts are important for career development of the education researchers. Most of the, as, uh, as a uh, uh, education expert, uh, if you want to have the job inside Japan, one of the main uh, area would be the kind of uh, uh, the, uh, the position of the teacher's training program. There, of course, that uh, the, we need to train the student to pass the examination organized by the Japanese language, and uh, it is highly linked with the Japanese culture and tradition. So from that point of view, it is almost mandatory that uh, to have a very high level conduct uh, ability of uh, Japanese in order to uh, train the or the, uh, prepare their your students to pass the uh, kind of the examination to be a teacher. What we found is a widely variety of the perspectives and ideas of internationalization among different education-related research associations. We also found these varieties even within a research association, one research association. Our alternative education community, the Japan Compared Education Society is not an exception. Some people discuss internationalization as universal, global, and others talk as international as a linkage between the more than one national, uh, national perspectives. And uh, it can also be discussed as a transnational. The second slide uh, the shows the background of this variation of our perspective on the internationalization of education research and the education research associations. We need to stress our education research activities are conducted on three main platforms. 
The first one is the individual and the project level. And this is the largest and the most important domain uh, for internationalization. So that each researcher or the each project are go freely uh, across the border uh, in order to conduct the research. The second platform will be universities and the research institute. The graduate education and the faculties are the main actors. Uh, in many cases, uh, the, these uh, the uh, domain could be hierarchical, namely some are so-called far class university and uh, dominates in uh, the graduate school education. Uh, some are regional, uh, some are international, and uh, many are national and local. And the research association is could be the kind of third uh, platform. Again, some are world association and uh, others are national, regional, international, national, and local. However, the relationship between the national and supranational associations with the, uh, the national association or the local association is not necessarily hierarchical relationship. In my impression, the relationship is more horizontal. For example, we just had a, the WELA World Education Research Association hosted by the American Education Research Association. But uh, everybody knows that the uh, ILA, the American Education Research Association, is much bigger than the WELA. This equal relationship could also apply to the relationship between the individual researchers and the individual uh, research associations. Actually, uh, any uh, research associations, including the JSCES, uh, we are highly rely on the individual initiative rather than the top-down initiative in terms to the international activities. When many of the international researchers, graduate school, and education research, education-related research association increase the activities in the international dimension, what would be the unique role of compatible education? and also the international education research from now. In this symposium, we invite four speakers with deep and wide insights to discuss the future direction of the competitive and international education research. The first speaker is uh, Maria Manzon. Uh, she's a leading scholar on research on competitive education research. We are proud that she's uh, an active full member of the JCES and also the faculty member of the Sofia University, a well-known international university in Japan. The second speaker is Terry Kim from St. Anthony's College, Oxford. Uh, she's based in the United Kingdom, and she has been leading the comparative, especially higher education research. Her insights on the academics and their identities in the global and the historical scope have given a significant impact on our thoughts on comparative and the higher education research. The third speaker is Edward Vickers of Kyushu University. He is currently the president of the Comparative Education Society of Asia, CESA. But today, he will talk as an individual scholar, not on behalf of the CESA. And that this is good for us so that we can hear his critical discussion. We also invited a Professor Jeremy Lapley uh, of Kyoto University. Unfortunately, he cannot uh, attend and talk today because of a health problem in his eyes in the last two weeks. As shown in his abstract uh, that was delivered uh, beforehand, he's, talking, uh, he's taking a very important role of proposing a distinguished uh, law in education research from Japan. He argues not only uh, does the enduring cultural gap between Japan and the Western countries uh, create a deep sensitivity towards differences, but Japanese philosophy has richly civilized and the relationship between the cultural uh, critic, self-knowledge, and also the cultural creativity. Then we invite you to Kitamura of the University of Tokyo as a discussant. He's the chair of the International Committee of JCES and is uh, actively 
engage in the various international education research associations such as WCCES, World Council of Comparative Education Societies, and also the WELA, uh, the uh, World Education Research Association. Finally, Miki Sugimura, uh, our president of JCES, will give a closing remark. Thank you again, and we hope uh, we will have a fruitful discussion today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Yunizo Sensei. Um, okay, so now let's move on to the main part of the symposium. Uh, we would like to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Maria Manson. Uh, Manson, uh, Maria Sensei, uh, yeah, please share your slide. Yes, it's okay. It's wonderful. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so could you start, please? Okay. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Yonezawa Sensei, for your warm welcome and generous introductions. Um, it is a great honor and privilege to be invited to this symposium with my distinguished panel members. And of course, we sincerely miss uh, Jeremy, Dr. Rapoli uh, today. So this symposium seeks to discern the unique role and identity of comparative and international education amidst the increasing internationalization of education research. The purpose of this paper is to give a broad historical and um, historical perspective and cross case comparison with other institutional and intellectual forms of comparative and international education. Thus, uh, the JCES can view its challenges and opportunities within a global context and perhaps learn and share experiences with other parts of the world. Hopefully we can find some answers to the uh, million dollar question that Yonezawa Sensei posed earlier. So um, my outline, well, um, uh, the paper is in three parts. Uh, the first, um, the theoretical lens, then the tracing our historical roots, and finally discerning our futures. So I draw on uh, the two theories, uh, Bourdieu, Pierre Bourdieu's logic of social practice and Betcher and Trowler's academic tribes and territories. Um, so first on Bourdieu, um, any social practice um, is a result of the interaction among habitus, capital, and field. And um, so, for example, scholarly practice like academic courses, university programs, professional societies like the JCES um, are, are a result of the dispositions and habitus of the CIE scholar the resource, the capital they possess in uh, linguistic, economic, whatever, um, institutional. And this, these uh, determine their position within a field, whether it's a professional society, university department. And um, they also interact with the external opportunities and constraints laid down by government, um, international trends in scholarship, etc. So the intellectual field is like a system of positions and oppositions of struggle of the occupants governed by the law of distinction. And um, well, I hope the translators are, 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 are fine. I, I don't know if I'm going too fast, so please just let me know. Veteran Trowler, uh, meanwhile, uh, used the, the conceptual term of academic tribes and territories. So academic tribes refers to the to us, academic communities, our sociological dimension, and the territories are the ideas, the, the ways of working that we have, um, um, basically the disciplinary epistemology. So applying that, for example, to the JCES, I understand that there are two sub-tribes, the area studies and the international education development sub-tribe, and um, both tribes have uh, their respective epistemologies, one more cultural anthropo anthropology and the other more on, um, well, educational action addressing uh, specific issues, poverty, alleviation, etc. So my argument uh, with respect to the development, the establishment of the field of comparative education is that it is constructed institutionally and intellectually not only uh, based on cognitive or intellectual criteria, but also on complex interactions of multi-level factors and actors, you know, structure and agency. And I particularly um, use this term institutional construction, which means 
that um, you know, different, uh, for example, professional societies, academic programs, how do they come in, uh, how do they get established or develop or contract? So it's as a result of the complex interplay of um, these uh, social forces or factors um, at the macro, meso, micro level, the habitus, our own habitus, we the scholars and our, our, uh, the different forms of capital that we possess in, in relation to knowing and doing comparative and international education and the way we interact with neighboring tribes and territories to compete, quote unquote, for distinction. Meanwhile, the intellectual construction refers to the epistemological dimension, the cognitive power we have uh, that we compete to have to name the field, uh, to, to um, uh, outline, the, delineate the boundaries of the field, which one is international education, which one is education, philosophy, etc. cetera. Um, and so these combined, the institutions and the definitions, these combined um, produce comparative educations in the plural, so multiple um, um, uh, facets um, of comparative education in different parts of the world. Um, so my particular research, which I'm going to share with you, um, is fully explained in this book, which was already published um, was that 10, 11 years ago. And um, there I reviewed extensive literature on the institutional and intellectual histories of the field, mainly in English, but also in um, other languages like Spanish, Chinese, and French. And um, I was particularly uh, personally involved in these two global histories projects, one on the World Council member societies and the other on the teaching of um, comparative education at universities worldwide. And these are also on being updated in their second, third editions. Um, so through these projects, I had collected cross-cultural data on more than over 52 uh, countries. So I move on to tracing our historical roots, institutional histories. So what, what I mean by institutionalization is the creation of a se separate sphere of scientific activity, for example, academic courses, scholarly societies, and um, I will focus on these two academic programs uh, at universities and the professional societies, their own, their histories and how those different uh, multi-level factors um, um, interacted with, with uh, scholars' um, uh, position in the field. So this map shows the, the early traceable university courses of comparative education in the world started at Columbia University in 1900, uh, in Manchester 1905. And we also have, well, Tokyo, Beijing, and uh, various others. Uh, these are all uh, within the um, period of 1900 to 1945. In terms of the member, uh, in terms of the comparative education societies, which are members of the World Council of Comparative Education Societies, so the World Council was created in 1970. Prior to that, there were already these various societies that you can see in 1950, the US CIES. 1960 to 70, we've got the European, the Japanese, the Canadian, and South Korean. So those five uh, uh, professional societies uh, were the founding members of the World Council of Comparative Education Societies. And um, well, these have uh, grown, the members have grown, and, and now there are 45. And of course, there are many more um, uh, comparative education societies, which are, there are several others which are not yet members of the World Council, but so there, there should be a total of more than 50 in, if existing in the world. Then, um, well, more than those uh, factual, you could say, um, uh, descriptions, um, I'd like now to uh, present my argument about the institutional construction of, of the field in terms of a university program and as a professional society. My argument is that it's not based only on intellectual uh, reasons of epistemology, but also pragmatic and, and political reasons. So the first, institutionalization at universities. Um, 
Okay, so we are um, right. So uh, the uh, I argue that in in some um, institutionalization, I mean the 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 recent accounting for um, academic programs of comparative education being established at universities is um, is this no, that the the scholars, I mean we. Uh, with with our habitus and capital, we interact with the societal discourses which are um, important at that time and which have created a demand for a specialized area called comparative education or CIE. Um, in some contexts, um, that meant that comparative education had power relations with governments regarding um, such movements as education abroad, best practices, educational reform. And that catalyzed um, uh, the formation of a, uh, an academic program because um, there was sufficient funding support you know, for, for such uh, work, specialized work. So I'll analyze um, the institutionalization of universities in, in terms of three typologies. As, as you know, I've, I've reviewed the global histories of the field. So I tried to classify them into three typologies. The first is that of, um, I take the U.S. as a case um, and uh, post-World War II internationalism, which led to a substantial expansion of the field. The second typology is that of the socialist bloc and post-war nationalisms at that time in, um, um, after World War II, uh, which led to the suppression, the elimination, so to speak, um, of CIE. And the third, typologies out of Spain and its national reformist policy. So uh, let's begin with the first typology, the U.S. and post-World War II internationalism. So the U.S. typology exemplifies the intertwining of discourses on comparative education with those on international and uh, um, development education. This led to uh, this was this developed under a favorable structure of American foreign policy which um, attracted academics with a habitus and linguistic social capital that could um, um, promote that global leadership in in the post-war era in in um, in the the defeated country so to speak and um, the structural, there was a structural opportunity for the comparative education um, with the significant government funding for, um, you know, um, scholarship abroad and um, technical assistance and also philanthropic uh, money, you know, Ford Foundation, etc. So that led to the substantial expansion at universities and publications and professional societies. In addition, because the U.S. and the U.K., had a central position in the geopolitical field, their universities were also very influential in the world, I could say knowledge system, and thus comparative education in the US and the UK served as a model and seedbed of CIE expansion in other parts of the world. For example, for the UK, it influenced the Commonwealth countries. Um, now, the second typology is the opposite. You could say the negative effect. No? Um, at that time, under the socialist bloc, especially Eastern Europe, um, the comparative education was suppressed at universities um, because uh, the logic that it, I mean, comparative education uh, was seen as probably a threat to the logic of the field of political power dominant at that time. And in other countries, uh, there was also the anti-Western, anti-American discourse, not only in the Soviet bloc, but also, uh, for example, in China or in South Africa, nationalism in Chile and Brazil. So in those places, they witnessed the closing down of the uh, courses and programs at universities and professors were disempowered. They lost their position um, and they were delegitimized, including even journal editors. Um, the International Ed Review of Educa uh, International Education Review it was called at that time. So what I mean is power related to knowledge. You know this since CE was power this um, CIE was power disabled. 
knowledge because it was power disabling to the societal or uh, political structure at that time. Then the third typology, um, Spain, and um, associated with the reformist policy of, of um, after its democratization, um, uh, that there we, we see that comparative education becomes a compulsory course nationwide. So the discourse then was um, Europeanization. Uh, Spain wanted to become a member of the European Union. And there was this international outlook that was in very uh, priced uh, uh, capital. Also, the personal biography of the education minister at that time was related to UNESCO, had an international background. These were uh, uh, the factors which led to uh, the establishment in a big scale of comparative education uh, nationwide in teacher, um, teacher training or teacher education. So um, similar examples took place in China and Kazakhstan at other points in time. And um, that was possible also because of their centralized education systems. So um, in these, we can see that struggle for distinction um, and competition for institutional space uh, against uh, um, other education subjects uh, um, it, within the, the university curriculum. So in summary, the three typologies, what can they reveal to us um, in terms of uh, the presence at universities of comparative education? That there's a, um, a power struggle for institutional space with adjacent uh, fields, that internationalization, whatever, however you define it, we know that we are many, many definitions that, um, that Yonezawa Sensei cited in his survey, um, that it is an old phenomenon and comparative education has survived and thrived. And that the presence or absence of CIE, its expansion or contraction at universities, is a result of this interaction between societal discourses on what is considered important or valuable in society, in politics, geopolitics, and um, how the academics interact within the bandwidth, uh, with it, with, given their uh, different forms of capital and position in the field. Now we move on to the other uh, form of institutionalization, which is that of professional societies, comparative education societies. And um, okay, so that uh, professional societies are another uh, way of establishing a distinct area of um, comparative education apart from general educational studies. So um, these examples um, show that society formation also is a quest for distinction in the field, sometimes resulting from micropolitical uh, reasons. One example, the spin-off of the British section of CZ, the from the, the CZ is the European Society of Comparative Education. So the British section um, separates and forms its own uh, national society. There's also a splintering phenomenon in France, wherein uh, one society, um, um, well, there are two sort of two different societies within the same country um, catering to different audiences of uh, education, comparative education. Then in some countries, um, the, there are sections, uh, comparative education is a section of the National Education Research, Research Association, like in Portugal and Cuba. Then there are also mergers because of declining numbers of um, inter, international education members. Um, then um, uh, some of the related societies um, try to uh, form uh, in the UK, they um, group together to form the OCFIAT, which holds um, conferences every two years and the, the different um, sub sub uh, societies like base um, uh, becomes the, the main organizer um, on alternate years. So they could also be merging, not just uh, splintering. The other uh, um, issue in the institutional histories of the societies is that of the name change. You know? So some of the societies have debated and changed their names, adding the international to the comparative education name. Uh, the JCS also had discussed this in the past, but remained with a C um, in order not to confuse, um, confuse it with the, uh, the, the other well-established Japan International Education Society. 
So these reflect changes um, in academic tribes, the people, and also the ideas they work with. And those are reflected in, the, uh, in these names and uh, such other uh, formation of societies. Um, okay, so um, what can we learn then from here? is that uh, there is that um, professional societies are a form of the quest for distinction, uh, for, for uh, institutional space in relation to other uh, similar or related educational societies. And it's not only um, moved by epistemological reasons, but also by pragmatic micropolitical reasons. Now I shift to the intellectual construction. So we, we, we move on after the institutions, programs, societies. Now we move on to the intellectual construction, which is the power to name and define CIE boundaries. Just one example, because of the limitation of time, is that of um, the struggle to define a canon for CIE. Uh, for example, Steve Cleese, the past president of CIES, sets educational action on poverty, inequality, and development as central to CIE. But uh, Robert Cowan uh, would, however, uh, be wary of scholars who act comparatively upon the education world. Instead, he would distinguish very strictly between academic comparative education and applied comparative education. So uh, from this, I would, I would claim that definitions are positional. Um, they are based on the scholar's position and in the field and the breadth of vision in relation to other positions in the field. And that is influenced by the scholar's habitus, uh, perhaps also some micropolitical interests, but also the cumulative work done. If one has worked more in international education or one more in the theoretical academic um, comparative education that, that shapes our view of the field. Then also our capital, uh, which is what is valued in academia, what is valued in the nation, what is valued in the international field, and of course our own epistemological position. So these determine the scholar's position and definitions. So each we cannot take definitions um, as uh, per se, but we need to examine who is talking from what position. So this is another way of viewing how uh, we comparativists um, interact with all these different multi-level uh, sociological uh, factors, geopolitical demands down to the students' demands, and with epistem epistemology, what is um, uh, what is uh, which which uh, disciplinary epistemology do we affiliate with, etc. So by by that, um, it will depend on whether the institutions and the definitions either broaden or become more strict. Um, okay. So um, winding down, um, if everything is internationalized, what then is the role of CIE? So if, they, if Yunizawa Sensei, you know, million dollar question, if the international dimension is also present in other fields of educational research, what then is um, left or what is our unique role? Um, I invoke Garcia Garrido, a Spanish comparativist, um, who located comparative education at the third level of comparison. So he classified the educational uh, sciences into subfields, the analytical, synthetic, and analytical synthetic. So um, the analytical sciences analyze analyze a specific aspect of the educational process and um, the, the actors as anthropological, the, the, the means or the methods, and uh, the ends, the why of education. And then also the synthetic sciences, well, they call it in Spain, general pedagogy, uh, studies the entire educational process. But history and comparative education fall under the hybrid of the analytical and synthetic. So um, uh, we we'll look at looking at education from the perspective of space and time. So from the perspective of, of comparative education, we have the challenging task of synthesizing the contribution of many different aspects 
of systems of education, drawing on the insights of diverse branches of education and other disciplines be be beyond education. Thus, it can be argued that the academic territory of the disciplines of, of sorry, the academic territory of CIE is wider than that of the internationalized sub-disciplines of educational sciences, internationalized psychology of education, sociology of education, etc. So we have a broader territory than theirs. Conclusion, discerning the futures. So after, have, after analyzing, having analyzed our global institutional and intellectual histories, we now go back to the question at the beginning. What is the unique role and identity of CIE? What are the worthwhile moral purposes of comparative and international education? Well, the JCES has two tribes. One seeks a deep understanding of a culture, while the other seeks to promote international cooperation in education and development. In my view, a worthwhile purpose of comparative education is to use the comparative method and perspectives to achieve the fullness of truth. Through comparison, we can transcend the partial individual truth in one society or philosophical tradition and ascend to a higher level of truth. The aim is not to evaluate or judge or rank which is better. The aim is holistic comprehension and dialogue across cultures. Having such holistic knowledge, we can seek to address issues of social justice based on the equal dignity of humans and our interconnectedness with the non-human world. They are the two sides of the same coin, the inseparable aims of comparative and international education. Thank you for your kind attention, and I look forward to a lively discussion with you and our panelists. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Maria Sensei. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Okay, all right, so um, we go. As I mentioned, that you can send your question through the Q and A icon at the bottom uh, anytime. Please feel free to send your question anytime. Okay. All right. So we go in, uh, move uh, move on to the second speaker, uh, Professor Terry Kim of Oxford University. Uh, Professor Terry Kim has uh, many affiliations on the on the slide here. Yeah. And could you could you start? Please. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess everyone can hear me well. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yonezawa, first of all, and the colleagues in JCS for organizing this symposium and inviting me to give a talk along with the distinguished colleagues. I'm greatly honored and delighted to join the panel. Um, Globalization and internationalization have been like parentary norms in our epoch and an important framework of thinking for our research and academic societies. While there is no single agreed definition, internationalization um, has been a core policy and one of the main features of transnational knowledge exchange to facilitate globalization, to think about how comparative education research has contributed to the internationalization of education research and its academic societies under global, globalization, um, I think it would be necessary to clarify the unique position of comparative education. Um, so start, I, I, I will start with these uh, following propositions. Comparative education is on the front line of international knowledge exchange, shaping transnational academic and policy discourses in education. 
there are multiple forms of doing comparative education research with a mixture of both practical and theoretical agendas, as um, uh, Dr. Maria Manzon uh, eloquently uh, illustrated in her uh, presentation. But I would say a common feature in comparative education research is this border crossing mobility. I argue that uh, border crossing is an essential act in doing comparative education research and has both actual and symbolic significance with direct relevance to globalization and internationalization. Um, comparative education researchers themselves are those who have moved out of their comfort zones and think and research more globally, assuming the position of a stranger employing the comparative gaze. Uh, that, that is my uh, argument uh, based on my observation of the last uh, 30 years of my um, position as being um, a comparativist. Uh, their embodied travel comparative knowledge entails a uh, Wissenschaften, uh, scientific knowledge, and uh, Weltanschauungen, uh, worldviews, framed by international relations. In other words, uh, comparative education research is axiomatically conditioned by geopolitics and international relations of the contemporary times. As Keita Takayama reminded us in his uh, insightful article on Beyond Comforting Histories, um, the particular historical and geopolitical context with, within which we operate set limits on what knowledge we produce so we need to uh, consider for whom and in what context our comparative education research is produced and used, especially when the relationship between our scholarship and international development agencies are closer than ever. With this uh, premise, my talk will cover the following themes. Uh, border crossing mobility as a methodological um, prerequisite in comparative education. Uh, the comparative gaze as the epistemic positioning in comparative knowledge creation, and Homo Viato, itinerant man, in doing diasporic comparative education. In fact, all four of us, uh, including uh, Jeremy Rapley, uh, who were invited to the symposium as speakers, happen to be Homo Viato doing diasporic comparative education, I thought. What I mean by diaspora comparative education here is comparative education undertaken by those who choose to undergo the existential and intellectual stresses of becoming a foreign. While they embrace the, uh, the professional identity of being comparative educationists, I hope my fellow presenters wouldn't mind being recognized as such, although I don't know whether it was a conscious choice by the organizer using that category when inviting us. I will address this position of the foreign, a stranger in my talk to highlight it is significant and advantage in comparative knowledge creation. Um, comparative education in terms of both uh, research and academic societies and links with the governments and international agencies um, has expanded, accumulating and absorbing far too many assumptions. Robert Cowan um, argued that in this simplification, if it is to say anything coherent, which can be disputed and rejected by new scholars within the field. He proclaimed um, a permanent academic agenda in doing comparative education that is to understand the intersection of international and domestic politics as they shape educational systems, patterns, and the compression of social power into educational forms, something that is made real for us in individual biographies and educated identities. Understanding those processes would permit us to speak truth unto the state, and a few other people as well said. Um, given the multiple forms of comparative education, there have been efforts to make a comparative history of comparative education recently, 
drawing on the intersection of personal and biographical, uh, sorry, personal and professional biographies of major comparativists in our history. For example, uh, most American scholars of comparative education edited by Erwin Epstein, published in 2019, and British scholars of comparative education edited by uh, David Phillips, published in uh, 2020. I was honored to write the afterword of the British volume, which helped me think about biographical narratives of contemporary comparative education we are making as entwined uh, with social and epistemic practices. Um, two more volumes are forthcoming as a part of Oxford Studies in Comparative Education book series. Um, one on a European history of comparative education edited by Jürgen Schrieber, and the other on an East Asian uh, history of comparative education edited by Anthony Welsh. And the special issue biographies of comparative education, knowledge and identity on the move uh, was edited by me and published in Comparative Education Journal in 2020. Uh, this special issue raised a question on the concept of the a foreign within comparative education, especially what is a foreigner? What is important about them in comparative education? Some of the uh, obvious characteristics found in the biographies of comparative education scholars in the past century are summarized here, uh, based on this David Phillips edited volume. Uh, their priorities in doing comparative education were focused on policy and advising governments. That led to the theorizing of educational policy transfer um, as a major agenda of attention for academic comparative education. In this sense, uh, Michael Stadler's a classic question in 1900, how far can we learn anything of practical value from the study of foreign systems of education? It's far from simple. It captures the essence of much of British comparative education of the 20th century. Secondly, the ability to write a narrative was considered a high of the skill and almost a definition of what it was to be a comparative educationalist. Thirdly, the role of foreigners was notable among the first generation of comparative educationists Nicholas Hans and Joseph Laurice were distinguished foreigners in London, whose counterparts in New York were Isaac Kandel and George, George Iroday. Their patterns of academic mobility and research agendas were understandable within their specific political times. Mainly Europe and the languages of importance, besides English, were, were then a French, Spanish, German, and Russian. What is fascinating as a counterpoint in our contemporary comparative history of comparative education is that amongst the contemporary, younger generation, several outstanding British and American comparativists speak Chinese and Japanese and have been migrated to East Asia to do academic comparative education. Whereas I, as the first Korean female comparative educationist trained in the London Institute of Education, and working in Britain and Europe. The concept and the role of the foreign is recurring contemporaneously and has been a major long-standing agenda of my comparative research over a decade. The institution institutionalization of comparative education as a field of studies to be taught as a university degree course is credited to uh, Joseph Laura and Nicholas Hans in London in the middle years of the 20th century. Thereon, their former students and or younger scholars in the field, including the authors in the present volumes and other contemporaries, have continued to consolidate academic comparative education in Britain and Europe and beyond through academic societies, uh, such as uh, CZ, uh, BASE, uh, ESER, CIS, World Congress, uh, World WCCS, and also academic journals such as Comparative Education, Oxford Review of Education, and Compare, and the World Year Book of Education, 
uh, for the last 40, 50 years or so. The relatively short history of comparative education as a field of academic inquiries over the last 100 years or so has seen several shifts of agenda and motivation reflecting the epoch of changing international relations. The agenda of attention in green comparative education has shifted from the desire to avoid conflict by understanding the other after the First World War to a means for constructing the other when new post-colonial nations emerged packaged by international agencies as a plan for development and then to the measuring the other and prescribing to the other by the end of the 20th century as illustrated by Noboa and also Mohammed and Morris. The agenda in doing comparative education, as Professor Cowen explained, has tended to drift into the epistemic and political position of asking what and how can we import? Whereas the tradition of international development education has tended to ask what can you, what can we advise you to import? Uh, this dis discrepancy is an unresolved tension, political as well as epistemic. And given the biographies of comparativists of the past century covered in this volume, what is startling is the absence of empires as a major research theme among the comparative educationists, especially given the, uh, the period of these formative years of comparative education in the late 19th century and, and throughout the 20th century. I think the, the time is right for us to attend to the empires. However, our academic comparative education agenda should be much broader and deeper than the contemporary decolonizing curricular movements and cancel culture. Following this line of comparative education tradition and mission in my academic journey, positioning is crucial in the process of comparative meaning making and new knowledge creation. I propose the comparative gaze as a means to understand positioning through the comparative gaze between the viewer gaze and the viewed gaze, the positioning becomes a relationship in which we enter. Sartre is considered the gaze, uh, the battleground for the self. As the gaze of the other is outside our immediate control. And Foucault, uh, in his work, in the birth of the clinic, extended this notion of gaze into the realm of surveillance. The gaze becomes the speaking eye, equated with a knowledge, which in turn is equated with power. Also, we should be mindful of not just a seeing gaze, but also a gaze imagined in the field of the other. As Lacan pointed out, the other is always relative, determined by the gaze, the way in which he or she is accessed. In the phenomenological uh, framework of thinking, the other is established through a kind of order that determines what is inside and what is outside and contributes the meanings of the other as the elsewhere itself or lively essence. The homeward in some mode of lived mutuality with the alien world, the world of difference and otherness. The theme of my special issue, Biographies of Comparative Education, is a contemporary version of the traditional theme, the comparative educations, comparative educationists as a foreigner. Um, there have been always migrant, transnational academics doing comparative education, who were the um, iconic comparativists such as George Giraudet, Nicholas Hans, Isaac Kandel, Joseph Lauray, Robert Ulvi, for instance, um, as part of our history of comparative education. However, academic migration happens more frequently nowadays and the field of comparative education is marked by a new generation of transnational academics. At the same time, many comparativists maintain strong connections and research interests in their country of origin. Among the contemporary scholars, 
in the field of comparative education, some have made quasi circular movements after having trained and worked in major centers. Um, if I may take the examples, such as uh, Ed, Ed Vickers, Keita Takayama, and Maria Manjon, could could be uh, this, uh, yeah, could be uh, this uh, transnational uh, mobile uh, comparativist in doing this uh, circular movements. And what is fascinating now is uh, East Asia. East Asia is becoming an attractive hub for comparativists. And Japan looks like becoming a new hub for comparative educationists. Just as Hong Kong has been a popular place for Western academic expatriates in East Asia. However, there is no simple account on how and why they are engaged in comparative education research in the particular place they chose and inhabit. I argue that the internationalization of education research and academic societies is strongly related to and also partially attributed to the notion of diasporic comparative education. As mentioned in a simple term, um, what I mean by diasporic comparative education is doing comparative education as a foreigner. Um, hence, the special issue came in. As shown here, I invited some of the contemporary scholars doing comparative education as foreigners, asking them to reflect on what kind of comparative education they do and why, not least in relation to their foreignness. All the contributors have crossed multiple borders and boundaries, territorial, linguistic, cultural, and many others. And they had a sense of restless, reflective discomfort without which worldwide change could not occur, as listed here. Uh, Elaine emphasizes uh, connecting capabilities, psychological pluralism, reflexive comparison as a method that may start with an autobiography of co-constructions of an other self. And Iveta and Yuan critique initiation into the acad academy still demands acrobats, phantoms, and fools. They suggest holographic transition beyond the official cartography of comparative education, asking who does not appear and why. What will happen if we reintroduce them, calling for collective infidelity? I think it may be called a uh, revolt of the others, instigating an epistemic revolt of all those otherwise. And Jeremy considers comparative education as cultural critique. Reviewing Viroday, Laurice, and Ulhi insightfully, he emphasizes the deep experience of other otherness that completely shifts the ontological ground towards immigrancy of being. And Justin uh, discusses connectivity and interlocking trends, emphasizing the enhanced relevance of comparative education in an age of competition and collaboration. He wants a reductionism in the form of selective use of comparative knowledge, while educational research and policy making are increasingly comparative. And Keita introduces negativity in his philosophical sense, speaking of his multiple international re relocations, which he identifies as a most significant context to transcend the territorial confinement of knowledge and act as an international knowledge broker. He emphasizes both epistemic and ontological transformation as a comparative educationist. He suggests negative comparative education as a metho methodological stance in a manner that challenges Eurocentric knowledge and contribute to the plur pluriverse world. Maria's article provides an autobiographical narrative of her journey of crossing multiple boundaries and concludes with the aim of moral purposiveness in comparative education teaching and research. That is engagement with the histories of comparative education. As mentioned earlier, my own article was on diaspora comparative education, discussing what I mean by becoming foreign, which implies notions of unfamiliarity, non-belonging, strangeness, otherness, distance, displacement, temporality, comparability, becoming 
foreign can bear dramatic social consequences that determine where and in what manner one lives and works, why and how one dies. And Professor Cowan wrote a postscriptum offering the wisdom that history is lived forward regarding this special issue as a contribution to writing the beginning of our future histories of the past while it was the beginning. So I propose a diasporic comparative education as a mode of internationalizing comparative education research and academic societies. Comparative education now involves crossing and bridging boundaries. Boundaries become suddenly, uh, suddenly becomes an idea at the center of a number of comparative fields. Foreigners in linguistic and epistemic metropole can be potentially good comparative education is, as evidenced in the formative years of comparative education, such as Hans, Larai, Kandel, Brickman, and Bjorgai. Language is a mode of subjective existence and a way of making sense of the world. Writing in a foreign language is a conscious ontological choice to become foreign epistemically, though not all of them doing comparative education and publish in foreign languages would become automatically liberated to assume strangerhood fully. Um, many comparative education researchers here, whose first language is not English, may have thought about the linguistic challenge in publishing and communicating in English as the academic lingua franca nowadays. But for some of the prominent scholars and writers, Shifting language was necessary and deliberate to make original contribution to knowledge. According to Samuel, Samuel Beckett's phrase, it is a need to be ill-equipped. And according to Jumpa Lahiri, it is like being, a, being in a self-imposed linguistic exile to transform her, herself. For Biorday, people wrestle with foreign ways to learn about their own roots. It is self-knowledge born of the awareness of others. A sort of relational and reflective awareness, understanding our own. We might say that may be the ultimate value of comparative education. I would emphasize here the peculiar function of the comparative gaze that makes it happen. And using the comparative gaze mindfully is essential in doing comparative research both practically and theoretically. I conclude with a kernel of a diasporic comparative education in our epoch that promotes mercantilist rent seeking economy. The contemporary managed university wishes to routinize research production and to routinize economic impact. Academics need contradiction and dialogue become and remain academics, and to sustain a crucial part of the social and political role of the university. The disturbance of banalities of belief. The crux is dialogue. Intellectual dialogue, I mean, the possibility of contradiction, the creation of different interpretations by the disciplined and imaginative refusal of academic orthodoxy. The academic problem is then how to sustain one's strangerhood in the domain of knowledge creation. So my conclusion, denouement, comparative educationists should take on the position of the foreign stranger and creatively escape from the binary division between the home world and alien world. As an inside outsider, an outside insider, by engaging in a diasporic comparative education. To produce a new comparative knowledge is to see a riddle, a problem, or a paradox not previously seen by anyone else. For many of us, as a border crossing mobile academics engaged in comparative knowledge creation, problem solving may be a more appropriate job than problem Problem finding may be a more appropriate job 
than problem solving. Um, so I will end it here for further discussion and thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Terry Kim. It's a very good, uh, great presentation based on your solid research. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm afraid uh, we are a bit behind the schedule, but uh, um, we're going to have a break now. Um, I'm sorry, uh, please allow me to show in the break, break time uh, until 4.30, okay, p.m., all right? So the time is limited, so please uh, understand that the break time is uh, shortened. Sorry. So, okay, please get back to, uh, get back at 4.30. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, okay. I hope uh, everyone is uh, getting back. Okay. Okay. Oh, but uh, okay. All right. So, so we'd like to resume the symposium. Okay, and then we're going to invite the third speaker, uh, Professor Edward Vickers of Kyushu University. All right. Uh, and he, uh, you, you, you don't use uh, any material on the screen. No. no. Okay. Okay. So please start your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm grateful to uh, uh, Professor uh, Yonezawa, Professor Sugimoto, and all their colleagues for uh, involving me in this uh, very interesting symposium uh, and for the opportunity to discuss with um, uh, Maria, Terry. Uh, Yuto Kitamura and, uh, and other uh, scholars. Um, now, as Yonizawa sensei mentioned at the outset, I'm not speaking in my capacity as president of the Comparative Education Society of Asia. Uh, I'm just speaking as plain Edward Vickers. Um, uh, and that's partly because what I'm talking about is, uh, I, 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 you know, what I'm saying concerning the need for scholars to engage more directly and more critically with the political context of education raises some issues that are quite sensitive for members of CESA. So I would be, you know, treading on dangerous territory if I claim to be talking in that capacity. Now, the fact that the scope for critical scholarship on education is very limited in many Asian societies actually makes discussing the politics of education particularly important in Asia. Uh, not only in Asia, but to an uh, especially alarming extent in many Asian societies, a rising tide of nationalism threatens to overwhelm uh, political discourse uh, and educational discourse, intimidating educators and gearing education at every level towards the promotion of tribalism and xenophobia. So we see state-sponsored trolling and harassment of Muslims in India, in Xinjiang, in China, oppressive national security education here in Hong Kong. So I'm speaking now from Hong Kong. Uh, growing intimidation of critical educators in the Philippines where the son of a dictator has just been installed as the new president. Uh, these are just some of the consequences of the, the, the oppressive political climate uh, that prevails across much of Asia. At the same time, governments and corporate interests, not just here in Asia, but worldwide, are promoting an ultra-competitive, individuating, meritocratic ideology that reduces education to the pursuit of job-ready skills. And linked to this, ever more intrusive forms of quantitative assessment of learners, of teachers, of schools, of researchers, are being deployed in the name of accountability to control and monitor the education sector, the work that we do as educators and as researchers. And the effect of all of this is to intensify a culture of competition and insecurity within schools and colleges that deters students and educators and researchers often from debating sensitive political issues or that denies us the time and energy to do this. Now, it would be wrong to say that comparative education scholars have ignored political issues. Uh, but self-declared critical scholars writing in English today uh, often portray problems of political oppression or competitive intensity or a reductive human capital oriented vision of education, all as ultimately the fault of colonial Western modernity or Western neoliberalism. Now, the legacies of Western colonialism and the influence of 
neoliberalism, Western or otherwise, uh, propagated through international organizations through such as the OECD or the World Bank. All, all of this is real uh, and has had real and malign effects. But do we really think that all the problems of our 21st century world or of our education systems can be laid at the door of Western states, Western dominated institutions, or something called Western culture or Western hegemony. Because if we believe this, then it's tantamount to believing, for example, that China's communists or India's Hindutva ideologues or the Ojichan in the Jiu Minshuto in Japan are all the brainwashed dupes of Wall Street and Silicon Valley. Now, there are several uh, problems or dangers with the recent fashion in Anglophone comparative education for decolonial critique focused almost exclusively on the West. First of all, the OECD or the World Bank or the American state are actually all relatively soft targets for critical scholarship. So for example, Andreas Schleicher, the boss of PISA, does not have the power to send his critics to rot in jail or undergo forcible re-education. Secondly, and more seriously, one-sided critiques of Western coloniality are propaganda gifts to authoritarian regimes in, in Asia and beyond. Work in the deep, in the sort of decolonial vein is actually increasingly cited today in scholarship and government propaganda coming out of China or India or other authoritarian societies in Asia and elsewhere. And it's used to support arguments that blame all manner of social and political problems on the West while bolstering the victimhood narratives that underpin authoritarian nationalism. Indeed, insofar as they provide ideological fuel for Asian authoritarians, arguments put forward by decolonial critics of the West can actually contribute to undermining or delegitimating scholarship that is critical of Asian governments or institutions. The unbalanced anti-Westernism of some decolonial scholars also, I fear, if anything, tends to alienate rather than persuade the broader public within Western societies themselves. Uh, so to the extent that this scholarship becomes known by the wider public in societies like America or Britain or Australia, it does not generally do anything to change people's minds or render them more open-minded or tolerant, often the opposite. Now for all that, at least the fashion for decolonial critique in Anglophone comparative education reflects an enduring scope or space for critical and politically engaged scholarship in many Western societies. Despite the attempts of right wing governments and corporate interests to undermine the security and the autonomy of the academic profession. Um, as is happening in societies like America or Britain or Australia. Um, so for all I, I've just said about the, uh, the, the weaknesses or the dangers uh, involved in some of this decol decolonial scholarship. Uh, I think it's, it's, there is value in much of it, and also it reflects uh, the scope that remains in many of these societies for critical um, research on the politics of education. But what of the situation across Asia? Now, I've recently spent two years working on a major global review of education coordinated by UNESCO's Mahatma Gandhi Institute on Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. This is in New Delhi in India. This is UNESCO's only category one institute in Asia. And the fact that it's associated with Gandhi suggests that it should see confronting 
the violently divisive political context for education in India and elsewhere as central to its mission, but it doesn't. Uh, now, this institute receives almost all of its funding from the Indian government, and that government is now dominated by Hindu fundamentalists and what we might call techno-fascists who have been seeking to intimidate or silence critical voices in the media and in academia within India. So far from promoting a Gandhian critique of the educational implications of chauvinist nationalism or religious fundamentalism, the Mahatma Gandhi Institute avoids all of that and instead today is focusing almost exclusively on brain science and psychology, which are areas that are entirely unthreatening to the Hindu nationalist agenda of the government there. And the Mahatma Gandhi Institute is not an outlier in the, the field of, of educational research or indeed of comparative educational research across Asia. Uh, both authoritarianism and neoliberalism across Asia and beyond make for a climate increasingly receptive to research that is that, that takes a narrowly skills-based atomizing focus on individual learners. So authoritarians like small state neoliberal ideologues are happiest with a vision of education for peace and sustainability, for example, that focuses on individual responsibility or even individual brains rather than on political context and the role of the state. Elites and corporate vested interests like to see social change as a matter of individual readjustment rather than systemic reform. So the problems, uh, or the, the problems with education or indeed with society are portrayed as problems to be solved fundamentally by readjusting or reforming individuals rather than changing the social context or challenging cultural or political orthodoxy. And many educational scholars have come to toe this line, this sort of, uh, and, and adopt this sort of individuating uh, focus or set of assumptions, sometimes out of fear, sometimes out of self-interest, and often out of both. Now, what is the specific relevance of all this to the internationalization of comparative education? Well, as um, uh, Terry and Maria have already uh, argued in, in different ways, I think, a diversity of voices within the scholarly, scholarly educational community plays a crucial role in supporting critical scholarship. Internationalization is important here for two reasons. Firstly, as comparativists, if we want to truly understand social, uh, political and cultural difference and its significance for education, it isn't enough, I think, just to observe it in a detached or distant way. We have to live it to some extent. Uh, so this is relevant to what Terry Kim was just saying about the, the role of diasporic uh, uh, educational comparativists. Now, one way to, to well, or perhaps one other way to ensure that we're able to sort of live cross-cultural, cross-national educational comparison is to import an element of diversity into the life of our own institutions. Now that's happened on a vast scale in many Western universities, uh, not just with the growth of international student numbers, which in many cases has been massive, but also with the diversification of academic faculty. In fact, internationalization of student recruitment, driven by a commercial logic, has arguably, I think, gone too far in many American, British, or Australian universities, for example. But insofar as we've also seen in these societies or these uni universities in these societies, uh, a diversification in the cultural backgrounds of academic faculty 
this does enhance the environment for comparative research, particularly research that challenges or questions long established assumptions and practices in these societies themselves. So the flourishing in Western institutions of decolonial critique, yeah, even though, um, as I've indicated, I'm critical <laughs> of much of this, but the, the flourishing of that critique in Western institutions for all its flaws is, I think, largely a testament of the, the, the increasing diversity of the faculty in those institutions. The, the fact that people are, are, are increasingly confronted there with uh, diversity, cultural, political, philosophical, and, and challenged by it. Secondly, and just as importantly, internationalization of the research environment in countries where academic freedom is relatively secure is important in providing a space for critical scholarship on other societies where such freedom is denied. So as I said, I'm speaking today from Hong Kong. Uh, and until just a few years ago, Hong Kong was perhaps the most important base in Asia for critical scholarship on education. Uh, and not just on education, but in the social sciences, humanities more generally. Chinese and other scholars based here in Hong Kong could pursue critical scholarship to an extent that was impossible or dangerous in their home societies. Now, that freedom was far from perfect, and many scholars here, frankly, made rather poor use of it, but it was nonetheless real. Since 2020, However, academic freedom in Hong Kong has been drastically curtailed. Uh, and I think it will be curtail, curtailed even further in the months and years to come. Now, this represents a challenge and an opportunity for the educational research community in Japan. Now, academic freedom in Japan, I think we have to, con we have to admit, is also far from perfect. Recent years have seen a concerted attack by rightists in the Japanese government on the funding and status of the social sciences in general and educational research in particular. But this has not robbed us of our freedom to publish what we want, to recruit students and to make academic appointments. We can use that freedom to inject a greater element of diversity into our academic community enabling us better to understand and explain the educational uh, challenges confronting us in Japan and in other societies. Japanese scholars, in partnership with international colleagues, can make Japanese universities havens of critical scholarship on Asian education in particular. And if this means a stronger voice for Japanese or for Japan-based scholars in international debates over comparative education, uh, something that I believe Jeremy was particularly keen to argue for today, then that will contribute to balancing what is an unhealthy dominance of Western-based or Anglophone voices in comparative and edu international education. But is this happening? So, are we taking advantage, uh, advantage of the opportunities that internationalization offers to reinvigorate Japanese educational research and offer a base for critical international scholarship? I'm afraid I don't think so. Despite now, I mean, there are exceptions, notable exceptions. Uh, uh, there are a number of um, talented uh, scholars uh, Japanese and non-Japanese based in Japan who are doing very valuable work, but the overall culture of educational research in Japan and of our faculties and departments remains far too timid and inward looking, often to the point of xenophobia. Now these are not problems peculiar to the field of education, in Japanese universities, but our field is not immune. There is too much unprotesting compliance with institutional pressures to focus on meaningless bureaucracy instead of research or teaching. 
Too many of us see ourselves as handmaids of government when we should be offering not just mild suggestions for improvement, but robust critique of the political agenda of education. Our hiring practices on the whole remain shamefully discriminatory against women, against foreigners, and against foreign trained Japanese. Underlying it all is a massive resistance to people and ideas seen as potentially disturbing to established ideas and practices. We're seeking to defend the comforts of the familiar when we should be providing an example to our students and to the wider society of intellectual openness and fearless truth-telling. So Maria mentioned in her conclusion, the importance of truth, you know, and I think that's, that's a value that's worth reminding ourselves of and holding on to. So I think this has to change, both for the sake of Japan itself and for the sake of the wider community of educational scholars, particularly across Asia. Japan could become a beacon of academic freedom and critical educational scholarship for Asia. Bringing more international scholars and internationally trained Japanese into our faculties and departments as full colleagues will also lend a new freshness, vigor, and critical edge to our research and teaching. And that's not, and I should stress this, that's not because foreigners or foreign trained scholars are better than those trained in Japan, but because this diversity will enrich us all. So let's stop resisting internationalization, if that's what we're doing, uh, and embrace it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Beakers. Um, uh, yes. So Professor Beakers uh, raised very, very, very critical challenges for comparative education, and in, in particular, uh, Jesse is uh, researchers, uh, scholars. Uh, yeah, it's, it was so wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we like to move on to the last part, uh, Professor uh, Yuto Kitamura of to uh, Tokyo University uh, will make a comment uh, uh, to the presentations. So could you please start, uh, Kitamura-sensei? Okay, thank you very much, Zimotsu-sensei. Uh, what a challenge to make comments to <laughs> such a wonderful, you know, uh, present, wonderful and thought-provoking and kind of shaking, you know, you kind of shake the, uh, <laughs> uh, my positionality, you know, I may be staying in a comfort zone to be a scholar in Japan. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, three presentations are really inspiring. And then I think, you know, uh, we can, we can discuss ours. I mean, so it's impossible for me to really uh you know make further comments but i just like to share what i really felt from the uh, each presentation and then also i like to pick up the uh question and answers from the floor and then you know raise questions to uh panelists okay so uh first uh, uh, maria already started from the theoretical uh, perspectives to discuss about uh, the uh institute institutionalizations of compatible education by applying the Buddhist uh, logic of social practice you know, using the concept of aptus and capital. And I was really inspired by those you know, sociological as well as epistemological discussions she had made. And I think it was very clear that the three typology she, for instance, shared uh, as an institutionalization at universities and then also uh, institutionalization as a compatible and international education societies. And it's a very important uh, concept she shared about academic tribes and also academic territories. And I was uh, thinking, uh, I mean, when she mentioned about the uh, canon, of compatible and international education, which are the academic versus applied by referring to the, uh, the, the speech by the Stephen Cleese. 
in Japan, we have in JCES, we have had the discussions over, I mean, the debates over uh, how we could position the area studies and development studies. So, because in Japan, the Japanese compatible education, its tradition is very much rooted more in area studies. And then the development studies uh, came later because due to the historical backgrounds, because uh, uh, Japan kind of tried to be more reserved to intervene to develop developing countries, you know, particularly in education field, because of our experience in, you know, uh, during the world, Second World War, or, I mean, Second World War, you know, we tried to force the Asian, some of the Asian people and societies to really introduce Japanese education. So that was a historical background why we kind of try to deserve not to do much on the development studies. However, since the 1990s and the 2000s, we, there has been the, you know, trends of uh, becoming, the development studies becoming more popular. And then there has been kind of a tension between the area studies and the development studies. And then, so it was a very uh, interesting to, to hear the, the discussions. And then, I think uh, uh, the Maria's discussion really reminded us to revisit and re examine the theoretical frameworks uh, uh, we have been familiar for many years, for instance. You know, uh, the, those center periphery, I mean, world system theory, like, you know, showing the center and peripheries, and then whether we are really depending on the Western knowledge in terms of the pro production of the knowledge and so on. So I, my question is how to really uh, change this uh, kind of the hierarchical order in terms of the production of knowledge uh, we have in the field of compatible and international education as well as education research, uh, you know, in a wider sense. So this actually relates to uh, what uh, Lely the Ed discussed uh, in the end in his uh, Lely's powerful <laughs> uh, talks, you know. But uh, this, uh, you know, hierarchical order is very strict and rigid. That's also for, uh, you know, as a, as a matter of the fact, that's, that's probably, uh, true as, as well. So how we can challenge this, uh, you know, a conventional uh, notion of uh, uh, world system theory or dependency theories and how we can really challenge that. That's one question I'd like to share with you. And I have a few questions and I also like to refer to some of the questions in the Q&A box. So each panelist, you can just pick up the, some of or one of my questions and then try to really respond to it please. So then I would like to move on to Terry's, you know, very, very insightful uh, presentations uh, about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the positionalities of the competitive education scholars and how we can be foreigner or stranger. I mean, it's, of course, we cannot really neglect the importance of geopolitical and also historical perspectives but how we can, be, we can position ourselves uh, uh, in order to have wider perspectives. So then uh, it was very interesting that Terry mentioned that uh, the historical development of compatible and international education, you know, starting, let it, be, let it start from, I mean, in the bottom line, I think, you know, we are always uh, in the compatible and international education, we've been always discussing about educational borrowing and uh, education uh, lending for many, many years. But uh, actually for the different purposes, first uh, understanding the other, but then constructing, constructing the other, then measuring the other, and then now prescribing to the other. So this historical uh, development is quite clear for us. Uh, but then, through such development of the competitive and international educations, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, what, what is really the roles of the competitive educational scholars? And uh, that's the issue of the positionalities. Uh, I think Teddy raised us. 
it was very, very interesting that she mentioned that becoming the, uh, we can be inside, outside, uh, or outside, inside. Uh, and then, in fact, uh, on the panel, this you are the very good examples of uh, kind of playing both roles, inside, outside us, and outside, inside us. So, uh, but uh, also, uh, Terry referred to the Asian uh, diversity as well. And for us, the language is always the issue. I mean, so it's kind of interesting. I mean, of course, you know, it's not only a Jap Japanese compatible educationalists or the, those compatible educationalists based in Japan. I mean, we, the training in the compatible education, the acquiring language, foreign language is very, very important and essential. And then that's, of course, you know, that applies to other uh, parts of the world as well. But in Japan, this issue of language has been very highlighted in the field of compatible education. So uh, somehow when you mention about foreigners or strangers, we kind of, uh, you know, link this issue of the language. Of course, language is not only just the, the words. Language actually reflects the identities and, you know, cultural and historical identities as well. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is that uh, that's kind of a uniqueness of Asia, how diversified the use of language in the regions. I mean, in Europe, of course, you know, there are several languages, but uh, now, for instance, you know, uh, but the, the roots of the language are kind of similar in a sense. Uh, if you take a look at Latin America, you know, of course, because of the colonial history, but they kind of share some language similar in Africa. I mean, Asia has more diversity in terms of the language. And this also makes the situation more, much more complex. Uh, so, it, you know, how, how do you think of the issue of language, in, particularly in the context of Asia? Uh, Again, you know, when I say language, it's not just the words. I mean, it, it's more like a representation of the culture, okay? And I now would like to move on to the Edith's uh, powerful speech. Uh, I was really uh, inspired by your discussions. And then actually when you discuss about the importance of the politics of education, yes, that's, that's uh, uh, probably to some extent, as you kind of mentioned, uh, the kind, many scholars, many not only compatible education lists, but many education scholars in Japan, we've been a bit of struggling to really deal with these uh, uh, political agendas. Of course, some people are very, uh, you know, have stronger voices, but uh, many scholars seem to be more reserved in Japan. I mean, is that the very cultural or social? <laughs> I'm not really sure, but uh, you know, some comparing to other countries, I mean, probably, you know, we may be a bit more reserved, but uh, at the same time, that doesn't mean we don't consider it as important. It, we really consider politics very, very important as well. Okay. And your discussion about the, uh, uh, you, know, you have raised many issues, I mean, like a state, the risks of state interventions to the, uh, as a risk for uh, academic freedom or uh, commercialization of education, which has been, you know, uh, growing in Asia, for instance. That may root it from the merit more meritocratic societies we have, particularly in East of Asia. And actually, the one, two questions uh, in the Q&A box uh, are talking about this commercialization of education. You know, they are talking about uh, how the preparation for jobs, uh, I mean, how we can regard, you know, first, first and fourth one, uh, the concern about the use of education for preparation for jobs, or the fourth one is about, you know, commercial-based education continues, what kind of impact? So these two questions are really about uh, the commercialization of educations. And 
also, uh, sorry, I also, uh, I should have also mentioned about the issue of mobility, which uh, three of all of you uh, mentioned, uh, and then particularly Terry, Larry made uh, quite interesting discussions. The second question in the Q&A box is talking about the mobility of the issue of the mobility. So you may also link up these two. And let me uh, look at uh, another side. Yes, uh, diversity of voices and uh, the the third, third questions, the current innovation problem solving approach. This also uh, refers to the current trend or the trend of the certain discourse about, for instance, competencies uh, promoted by OECD. And you know, this influence of the uh, international organizations, which has been, which may be influenced by the Western neoliberalism as well, or, you know, so this uh, third question can be also linked to what uh, Ed discussed about uh, uh, the, the, you know, how we could treat the decolonized discourses, uh, particularly in the very Anglophone compatible education fields today, and how we can really decolonize the scholarship. And, so there are more and more issues. I mean, I don't have, I, I actually took notes for, for of more than 10 pages <laughs> because I was, I was so inspired by the three, you know, uh, very wonderful uh, presentations. But then uh, the last but not the least, I mean, I, I think this is very important uh, message to us who are based in, and the comparative educationalists who are based in Japan. Uh, because uh, as Edel kind of mentioned that uh, we, there may be a possibility for us to promote more collaboration with uh, you know, scholars outside Japan. And it's not only compatible education, but the education field uh, in general, I think uh, uh, this is very important. And then that's why Aki has come up with this project to really encourage it in particular, the younger generations to uh, explore the ways to be connected with the experts outside Japan, because, because of challenging all these issues three of you raised today. So I think, uh, uh, I particularly, of course, you know, among these uh, almost 160 audience, uh, I mean, there are diversity, but in particular, I like to encourage younger ones. I mean, younger doesn't mean in terms of age, but you know, yeah, in terms of mindset, I, mean, I still feel I'm young as well. <laughs> uh, we can, we can, we can you know, explore the ways to really uh, share what we have found in our compatible education researches and with the competitive education lists outside the countries. I mean, of course, both inside and outside countries and to explore the future of uh, uh, competitive education. So I think JCES has very important roles to play. And, but at the same time, we should not be, we should not forget about the historical backgrounds as well, uh, backgrounds and context as well. I mean, why the competitive education becomes so uh, kind of popular in Japan in uh, you know comparing to other countries Japan started uh, kind of earlier as uh, uh, Maria ex explained because of the history I think you know history of Japan but anyway I shouldn't spend too much time because I really like to hear the responses from each panelist so uh, I hope uh, what I said that make some sense to you but uh, again, thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, wonderful presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, very organized and comprehensive comments uh, to all the speakers. Uh, okay, so, so I, I would like uh, I'd like every speaker to reply to Kokitamura Sensei's uh, comments and questions, um, but the time is uh, limited. So uh, <laughs> uh, please speak for um, two minutes <laughs> each. Okay. 
Uh, so please start the uh, Maria Sensei. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Yuto Sensei, for your very generous comments and thought-provoking uh, question. I'll, I'll tackle the one you mentioned about how can we alter the hierarchical or, um, order in, in knowledge production. I think we're already doing that. To be honest, uh, a very small example is the International um, Editorial Board of Comparative Education UK. I see that the new members that they have invited, including myself, thank you, is uh, there, we're, there are more Asians now on, on that, on that uh, advisory board. So I think uh, we, we make use of the, uh, the capital, her position um, uh, at the service of enriching. I mean, not putting ourselves up there, but enriching the, the dialogue, the conversation. And now that also Asia is like the center of attention, maybe brought up by PISA or what have you, we have we are the authorities to to um, give the hermeneutics, you know, to explain what really is the soul of of education in Asia, um, and not just the numbers. So um, I think we can um, take uh, advantage of that um, opportunity. And many of the Japanese scholars of JCS are well placed also in international um, education advisories or World Council, etc. So. Um, yes, uh, make use of, of those um, positions to create new knowledge from from the other side you know, uh, and critiquing perhaps, or not only critiquing, but collaborating with the existing um, knowledge order and bringing new, new visions. That's all for me. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Professor Terike, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yuto Kitamura, uh, for your comprehensive, insightful summary uh, and comments on our presentations. And uh, regarding um, your uh, your point about this, um, the position of the foreigner and the stranger uh, taking this uh, inside outsider, outside insider, the role uh, in creating comparative knowledge as, as a comparative education is that I, I mentioned. I think it's not just confined to the, uh, the people who are literally a foreigners uh, doing comparative education as a foreigner in a country outside of their origin. I think we comparativists can assume that uh, this uh, the notion of the strangerhood in epistemic uh, positioning and then uh, doing comparative education, uh, knowledge creation. Um, so it's, uh, it is, I'd like to emphasize that it's this uh, epistemic positioning, not necessarily, um, not, not only about the physical mobility uh, per se, um, and then it's um, having that positioning, I think it is important uh, to, to be mindful of the, uh, thinking outside the box. Because uh, when I mentioned that, um, the, perhaps the more appropriate role for comparativists would be problem finding rather than problem solving uh, itself. So I know that as, as uh, the comments uh, in, in the Q&A box, uh, some mentioned that this importance of problem solving in uh, as linked to this uh, one element of the uh, competency uh, measured by OECD, for instance, um, it is all about uh, you know the, the given uh, given norm and paradigm uh, operated by the international organization as such as OECD or the the government set target. I mean, even problem solving is yeah is required. Uh, to be measured, and then I think the comparative, uh, as as Adika also mentioned, to be uh, the robust, uh, to to make a robust critical comparative education, it is important to be uh, to 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 be outside of the box, uh, and then to to find uh, something that uh, the most people have taken for granted and do not even think it is a problem. But we as a comparativist who have a multi-dimension of different uh, norms and different uh, 
um, systems uh, we are aware of, we can actually offer a problem, uh, the new problem uh, found in our comparative knowledge, in the process of comparative knowledge creation. And then, um, am I uh, taking up too much time? Or, I mean, one, one, one more comment, may I, uh, in response to uh, uh, you know, uh, Professor Kitamura's comment about diversity within Asia. I think that, uh, as mentioned in the um, in my special issue on uh, internationalization and development in East Asian uh, higher education, the special issue that I edited, the term Asia indeed is um, is a geographical uh, referent, but without uh, necessarily uh, the cultural. Uh, um, the commonality, but so when we say the uh, some kind of uh, common ground we talk about within Asia, it may be more precise. Uh, it may be more relevant to to consider East Asia, which has the uh, I think the the confusion uh, and also the uh, the Chinese logographic writing system we we share in the. Um, in the in the civilization, um, um, I mean, like China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, and, and yeah, the, those um, the confusion and the uh, like a European um, the civilization based on Latin. Um, I think this a Chin Chinese logographic uh, writing. Uh, enabled uh, the the mobility and communication of the uh, East Asian scholars uh, in the ancient times and then but contemporaneously I mean we we are obviously uh, hyper diverse and then beyond this uh, continental uh, boundaries and borders I and mean, as I mentioned that Western scholars like um, Ed Vickers, Jeremy Ratley, um, I mean, and many others, they are, um, they have acquired the knowledge of the, the East Asian languages and then they do the uh, academic, robust critical academic comparative education based in Japan. And as I mentioned, the Japan, I think is has become a new hub for uh, critical academic comparative education. Um, so, yeah, I will stop here. And uh, I thank you very much again for the uh, insightful comments and and this uh, this uh, the symposium. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Token. So, uh, Professor Vickers, please speak up again. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to pick up on that point about language and diversity that Terry Kim was discussing. Uh, and that uh, Yuta Kitamura uh, raised, because I think it's a very important one. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, I am sure I'm not the only one with the experience, you know, having worked in Japan now for just over 10 years, uh, of having supervised many Chinese PhD students who have excellent Japanese well, PhD, postgraduate students who have, yeah, you know, excellent Japanese and often quite good English as well. Uh, but, you know, struggling to find any Japanese students with equivalent skills. And this maybe strays beyond the focus of this discussion, but I think as uh, educational scholars based in Japan, and particularly as scholars in the field of comparative and international education, we should perhaps, and this does relate to my point about politics, we should be getting involved in a political debate about the priorities of education, including schooling within Japan, and asking why is it that schools in Japan do not prepare students to communicate in any foreign language? I mean, to some extent in English, uh, but never in Chinese, never in Korean, never in Asian modern Asian languages, you know, uh, this is extraordinary in, in international terms, the, the, the complete neglect of any foreign languages other than English. I mean, to some extent, it's a feature of education systems across East Asia, but Japan is an extreme case, even within East Asia. 
Uh, and this is, it raises questions about the political agenda of education uh, in Japan, more broadly, I think. And now, you, uh, Professor Kitamura um, mentioned the, the comments uh, in, in the sort of question and answer box uh, and how they, they raised questions relating to commercialization of education or the comment I made about the sort of focus on job oriented skills. I think these may be confused two separate issues, distinct issues, which is commercialization and uh, an instrumental vision of education. So, I mean, I mentioned commercialization as a feature of higher education in many systems in many Western, especially many Anglophone countries. And actually in that respect, you know, Japan's higher education system still now today remains less commercialized than uh, systems in England or in America, for example. And that is a strength, actually. That's, a, that's something precious that we need to try to uh, protect. Um, although, as we know, I mean, this is something that is also under threat in Japan. There is pressure to, um, to sort of make money drive the priorities of our research, you know, more directly uh, in Japan as well. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the instrumental vision of education's purposes uh, in Japan in particular is closely connected to the, the government critique or the Ministry of Education's critique of um, education in universities as a field of research, as distinct from education as a field for teacher training or, you know, uh, policy, directly policy related um, uh, research on educational improvement. Um, so, yeah, I mean, instrumentalism is, is, is I think, a key target for us uh, as, criti as critics of education policy within Japan, but also as comparativists, um, you know, looking at the international sphere. Um, I think I'll stop there. Uh, I, I was going to respond to Professor Kitamura's sort of remarks about politics, but I'll leave that for the moment. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, actually, we have passed the closing time, uh, but the, please give us give us a few more minutes to to conclude the, the symposium. Um, so, Kitamura says, do you need any responses? Okay, no. Okay. So, and how about the Professor Yunizawa, uh, Yunizawa Sensei? Do do you make some comments? Okay. Uh, thank you so yeah. much. And uh, I simply uh, would like to say that. Uh, uh, the, to respond positively to the, the third comments from the Q&A box that the innovation. And uh, thanks for the innovation of the communication materials and the online uh, tools. We can make it uh, this kind of a very stimulus, similar discussion in Japan or the kind of from Japan or the with Japan. So the, I think it is really the promising time. And the language is mat uh, does matter, but the, uh, the, this is uh, I really thanks to the, the two excellent colleagues uh, who are doing the uh, trans interpretation and also the we record this discussion so that this means that uh, we can use it for any language later. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, all the, the speakers. And uh, so at last, we are going to invite uh, Professor Sugimura Sensei, uh, the, the president of JCES, uh, to make uh, concrete remarks. Okay, Sugimura Sensei, please. Thank you very much for the excellent, exciting, and provoking the symposium today. On behalf of the Japan Comparative Education Society, I'd like to say a few final words with appreciation to all. First of all, I'd like to thank the presenters who took time out of their busy schedule to speak today. In order of appearance, Dr. Mario Manzon, Dr. Terry Kim, and Dr. Edward Vickers all came in from overseas or Tokyo, respectively, and gave us a wonderful speech. Thank you very much. All of them are very leading researchers in comparative education today. 
and we are truly honored to have them here in one place. I would like so to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Kitamura for his uh, wonderful discussion and comments. Very comprehensive, uh, very good discussion in responsible to this. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank the conference steering committee for organizing this symposium. First of all, the Professor Unezawa, uh, committee director, chairperson of Tohoku University, and also wonderful support from the professors and the scholars, including young scholars from Tohoku and Hokkaido areas. Listening to today's discussion, I have once again thought deeply about the role, current role of comparative international education. In particular, your discussion gave me an important opportunity to think about the role of comparative education in Japan. At the very beginning of this symposium, Professor Yonezawa pointed out the need to consider the national or local context in contrast to the inherent internationality of education research. And also Dr. Manson touched on the history of comparative education and development of the university and academic associates, uh, its various and the policy of intercultural construction and the role of comparative education. And also questioned its role. She stated the mission of comparative education is to achieve true through comparison by doing so, uh, it will realize a human dignity and social justice. Professor Terry also emphasized a unique position of comparative education as a, I think it's a homo fighter by facilitating knowledge exchange and crossing borders. And also Professor Terry also proposed the concept of the comparative case and the implication and the kernel of dio Di diasporic comparative education research while moving across borders. She also pointed out the East Asian role and Japan in particular has the potential to become an interesting research center in the future. Dr. Vickers, thank you very much. You're wonderful and very cutting edge, the insightful speech. You also pointed out the importance of the future role of Japanese university and research institute in this area, using the critique of the colonialist scholars, as an example, you pointed out the political use of academic and the harm done by authoritarianism and commercialism is a narrow sense of skill-based education. But oh yes, we must rethink it very, very carefully. But also you spoke of the importance of the understanding and practicing the social, political and cultural differences. So those points uh, very inspired us. Thank you very much. We must think about the comparative education role with uh, ensure academic freedom. If I were to characterize Japanese comparative education for a moment as a role it's internationalizing world, many people say, yes, in the comparative education research in Japan is strongly oriented towards the emphasizing field work unlike the Western methodologies that aim for theorization. For this reason, sometimes uh, we regard it as a peripheral research with a theorizing orientation or as a counter strategy to Western research. But also it can be said that Japanese comparative education research, while characterized by the field, more in-depth field work, we also aware of the back and first between the theorizing and differentiation. So furthermore, recently, an uh, international agenda-based approach, which includes the international cooperation in education, and also the concept of transboundary field work based on the tri triangulation or the border studies, which are discussed in the last years of uh, this annual conference so much. So as a new way of looking at the field itself have also emerged. So therefore, it can be said that Japanese comparative education research should be try to look for the new a kind of orientation while considering the today's discussion. So we want to try to make our association more 
a kind of the uh, gateway to this East Asia or ASEAN region research in this area. So in that sense, I deeply appreciate your today's uh, wonderful comments and also suggestion for the Japanese Comparative Education Society, but not only for us, but also for our, all the Comparative and International Educators. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. And uh, I deeply appreciate all the participants here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Simru Sensei. Uh, so, okay, thanks. So we now, uh, here, we are, we are going to close the symposium. Thank you very much, all the people, uh, for your uh, active participation and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, actually, the, we need to go to the General Assembly soon, but uh, uh, the, I really, really enjoyed and uh, that, uh, let us continue to discuss uh, you know, the, in a, uh, very soon. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Thank you so much.